All right, there we go. Hello, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to another Hobby Cheating Q&A Live. Uh, so it's going to take just a moment here for it to all catch up, but uh, but we'll get going. Hopefully in just a moment, you'll all see the, the, the stream is live. There we go. Uh, so <clears throat> what is this? Well, Hobby Cheating Q&A Live is when we get together uh, once a month to answer all of your hobby-related questions. So for about the next hour or so, uh, I'm going to sit here. Uh, somebody give me a thumbs up. Hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, hopefully my sound is coming through. Uh, so hopefully we're good. Somebody say, yes, we can hear you. Yes, we can see you. Everything's good. I'll just keep talking as though you can for the next moment or so. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is, uh, is answer all of your hobby related questions for about the next hour. You drop them in the chat, uh, over on the side, you know, here, one of these sides and, uh, you know, we can, uh, we'll, I'll do my best, my level best to, uh, answer them. Awesome. Coming through loud and clear. Okay, great. So, uh, let's get going. We had a couple pre-questions asked. I'm just going to jump right into the pre-questions while people are dropping in some new ones. Uh, okay. So I'll look over here, by the way. So I'm, the, my, my thing I'm watching this on for the questions is over here. Um, all right. So Yan Hei said, question, uh, my chemistry teacher insisted that good mixing equals repeatedly going head over heel turns is greater than shaking, but we all shake. Uh, they were talking about test tubes and vials. Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I think that they're probably right, just like technically. But I mean, what I do, so for me, I, I shake it back and forth to go up and down. Then we go a little like this to get that going. And then I'll actually just, I'll give the, the rotate, like I'll just flip it around, you know, this kind of thing. Either like actually spin it or whatever and then shake it again. That's generally what I do. I mean, the best thing you can do is buy one of those really overpriced little nail polish paint shakers or whatever, like the little nubbin thing that you just touch the paint to and it's like, brrr, it vibrates it at hyperspeed. Um, that's probably the best, but you know, I don't have one of those because that seems like a big investment for something that just makes your paint go like that, that I can do with my hand. So let me just throw paint on the ground. That's a good idea. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure like, I don't know, mix of all of it. I don't know that there's a huge deal. Medium will separate in some paints and sit on the top. So, I mean, the, the most important thing you can do, which you couldn't do in chemistry class is have an agitator in there. So have a non-ferrous agitator. Um, I use old pewter miniatures. Um, so I'll cut up old pewter miniatures that I don't have any desires for or use for, and I'll just put those pieces into the paint. An agitator is going to do you far more than any directional change in your shaking. All right. Uh, Yen says, is it okay to use water to re-moist a drying pot of paint? Generally, no. Um, it won't do much. If you're going to try to... If, if paint is dry, you, there's generally not much you can do depending on how dry it is. If it's only started to go, then you want to re-add some kind of medium. Um, so like just pick some kind of like thinner medium from Vallejo or Lamian medium from, uh, Citadel or like green stuff, world's master medium or whatever, because the problem is if you just add water, you're just adding solvent paint consists of three things, pigment, uh, medium and solvent. And the water is the solvent. It's what breaks things down and thins it out. Um, you don't want to use just, uh, and, and if you use just, uh, the solvent in there, you actually won't get a good result at all. So there you go. Uh, Matthias greetings from Denmark. Hey, Matthias, how you doing? Uh, okay. Uh, well, we're happy to have you along for the live one, man. Let's see. Carl, uh, when painting ornate colored armor plates like Zangor, what is the best strategy? I end up layering with the metal at the bottom, but would prefer to exploit the zenithal undershade when coloring. Uh, I guess varnish after painting colors, then apply the metal with great brush control uh, is the way to go, but any thoughts are appreciated. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the reasons I hate those kinds of models. Um, the answer is you're, you already guessed it. Like, I've never found a better way 
than zenithaling the whole model, doing all the parts that are, you know, flesh and the armor plates and colored and stuff like that. And then just going back in and applying the metal carefully around the edge. I wish I could tell you there was some better way, some sneaky thing, but brocaded metal like the um like the chaos space marines or like xangor a lot of chaos uh, forces have this kind of thing i think blood warriors have the same thing yeah um it's just annoying it's just it's like it's just a it's just an awful awful design to paint um because of the nature of all those little interlocking plates i just it's one of my least favorite design things um so it's also not present in any of the Slanesh stuff, which I like. Uh, so there you go. But I, yeah, I've painted plenty of Zangor in my life, and uh, they were not fun. All right, uh, let's see. Surface tension. Going to attempt a uh, lake ice base for a dreadnought. Just watch your video, and it looks helpful. But as it was a while ago, is there any improvements or updates you'd recommend? Um, yeah, boy, that was a long time ago. That was like the fifth hobby cheating video I did. Um, yeah, you can do, so if you want to go to sort of next level stuff, uh, and you've got the time, especially for one model, like a dreadnought, do it in layers. Um, <clears throat> so that is to say, pour a layer like you saw me do there. And instead of doing the individual cracks, just do some like very thin scratches and hashes on a piece, like directionally, and then pour another layer on top of it and then do that again. And then, but less or something, and then do another layer and do those cracks on the top and make sure a big crack runs over where you've put that interlocking lattice work. What it'll end up looking like is the fuzzy sort of buried imperfections and cracks in ice. Um, other than that, I think it's still a technique that holds up. Um, I don't know that I'd use Martian Iron Earth anymore. There are other cracking things that aren't as hard to cover up, frankly, as the red is of Martian Iron Earth. Like, you could use one of the other colors um i would probably do my snow on top a little differently so like i that snow that i was doing then was rather clumpy so like i would probably use the snow out of like hobby cheating 93 or whatever something like that that was about doing realistic snow i'd probably make it more like that um where you see a little bit more of the dusting across the thing maybe a little white pigment to even sell that a little more so but the ice itself, though, the core conceit, I think, is still the exact same way I'd attack it today. Uh, all right. Sebastian, uh, I want to do teal sylvaneth leaves and struggle to get depth on those small areas. Any tips on color and technique to maintain brightness while not looking bland, or do I just expect too much? No, I mean, it's, you know, it's it's a question of just fine brush control. Um the if you're gonna do like teal leaves you know get yourself like a nice deeper green something like a despair green from scale 75 and then you want to get that you know fairly thin but under control and you're going to put a drop of that in the center of each of those leaves after you do after you paint the leaf teal and then you're going to take some of your original teal and mix it with like i generally just prefer like a white gray or something or a pure white you can get away with it with teal and you just kind of, we got two options. You got the, the drive yourself psychotic option and the, the more sane option. Um, so the, the <clears throat> sane option is you just kind of edge each leaf, right? Um, like what I would do is I would paint the whole thing. Like it, generally my tactic with stuff like this is I paint the whole thing teal. You drop the darker thing in. You do a little bit of the light part around the edge and then you go back with your mid-tone again and you kind of blend them together. So you're doing each leaf kind of four times, which is sensible. The other option is you come in with an extremely sharp brush. <coughs> excuse me. And that white green. And you just do little like slashes coming out toward the edge. Like very careful little controlled slashes. So, but that's, you know, the type of thing where settle in, you're going to be there for a while. So something like that. Uh, Despair Green is generally what I found is a very good uh, low tone for teal from scale 75. If you don't have that, just mix like some blue black into your into your teal and you'll get to the right place. Okay, Greg, uh, you've often recommended priming in German gray. Yes, that's my base primer color for everything. 
How do you work the darker tones in for the shadows? Do you do an underspray of black or just feel the air, feel in the areas as you go? Well, German gray is really dark. It's basically black. It's real world black. Um, what I mean by that is like in the real world, there are very few things that are actually black. Um, so it like just there's too much light pollution in the world around us. So I'm actually usually trying to get rid of that stuff because otherwise it's not dark enough. Um, so like the darker tones, yeah, I mean, I just work in the in the shadows. Like um, I, I don't underspray black in general. I don't feel the need to go any darker than what that German gray is. It, in fact, it's often still too dark for what you want to do. So I'll underspray some other color to actually turn the the German gray into a color. So for example, like I've got this keeper on the screen right now. Um, you know, when I did her, uh, her, I had to do like an all over purple from below to get rid of any of that black being there because I don't actually want any of that black showing through. Um, it's a dead color. It's not worth anything. Um, shadows aren't black and gray shadows are deep reds and deep blues and deep greens and when you make shadows that color things get much more visually interesting so what i'm actually usually trying to do is is get rid of that it's just the primer color of convenience for most cases because if you like full black is way too dark if i didn't answer your question there greg you can you can rephrase something if i didn't if i didn't zero in properly there uh, all right, Jeremiah, thinking about using Apothecary White over Gracier Primer for a birch wood effect on my Sylvaneth. Well, I don't think it's really going to look like birch wood. Um, I mean, I think that's a perfectly fine shot at getting that white. That's fine. But, you know, birch wood is defined by the, by the dark as much as the light. I think of the old, you know, I think of Bob Ross. He painted a lot of birch trees, right? And that's because it's, it has this like interlocking very dark against very light. So <clears throat> if you were really trying to do birch trees, you'd need to like hash in the dark color um, to like get that where the, the, where the bark is very dark. So like, I mean, we'll just switch over and do this. Birch trees. Right, so they have this these dark hashes in them all over the place. Right, they're, they're like little little spots, like little zebra stripes and stuff. So you would need to capture that to make it feel like a birch tree is my point. So you'd want to go back in. I think that'd be fine as your base white. I don't think there's any problem with that. I just think you, you didn't have to go back in and hash out this dark brown, dark brown black. So there you go for what that's worth. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. Devin Jones. Oh, you flipped it around on me there, Devin. All right. I've moved mostly sketch style. Uh, a problem I found is when I want to create a highlight, it feels so much harder to create a smooth blend than a layer style because the color combination of the ink and the zenithal does not generally feel easy to match. Um, keep using the ink. Like... I've, I've, I find that to be one of the advantages. So if you go back and watch, like, watch how I do the speed painting an army in a week. Go back and watch that video again. And you'll see that, like, I use a lot of, like, loaded brush and wet blending and stuff like that because it's just easy and fast. And so I'll take, like, an ivory or something like that. I'll create my highlight, but I'll have the, and then either I'll just wet blend it or loaded brush it. I'll take the original ink that I used and just start blending it down. Um, so, you know, you kind of like, you know, this is the highlight I'm trying to do. So I'll just like touch the ivory here and then come back in with the ink and just pull it down to here and touch the ivory here and pull the ink down and so on and so forth. Then you end up using the same colors. It, like if you watch how I painted those empire dudes in, in orange and purple, that was more or less exactly the tactics I was taking. Just using the, the ivory along with the, the, the base ink that I set it with. And then you shouldn't have a problem. Hopefully that helps. Uh, w. Soren, uh, I'm in the planning stages uh, for my next project, and that project is going to be themed on classic Norse frost giants. I am thinking of a very desaturated blue for the skin and a normal flesh tone. Yeah, sure. Makes sense. 
Um, in general, what's going to make flesh look like flesh is when you work in some kind of skin tone, be it a Caucasian skin tone or a dark skin tone or African, anything like that. Having that kind of actual, like what we in the world perceive as, you know, existing human skin tone um, will generally make it feel like it's actually skin. Like if you just, if you, if you go blue and it's just like all blue, that doesn't feel like blue. So like, again, just to reference this little demon right here um, that's on the screen, like she has flesh tone bits worked into her. Um, like I'm using some of that as my, one of my highlight colors. It's weak, but it's important to be there, right? We just, we get a sense of it. Um, so, but yeah, and that's good. Um, one of my favorite pieces of, of frost giant art. So let's see if we can find it real quick. Frost giant art D and D. Oh, where's it at? There it is. So you can see how this, the, the artist still used, no, oh, that's covered up by my face, isn't it? Sorry. Here, let's pull that out real quick. Stop it. There we go. When I, I hate when I do this because it always shows it real small. Let's just do this. Open image in a new tab. Aha! There it is. All right. You can see how the, see how the artist is still using skin tones and, and warm yellows. There's reds here in the shadows. So even though this is clearly a frost giant in a frosty setting about to really kill these two people, um, you still have this sense of a living creature from it. Right? So, um, but yeah, absolutely. All right. You can go back in there. I like having this little screen share thing while I'm doing this. This makes a lot of these answers a lot easier. Uh, what is the picture in the bottom right? That is a, at some point in time, I've been just like trying to figure out a use for this thing. I don't remember who sent it to me. Um... But somebody sent me this picture a while back. Might have been like, might have been dicey. I don't know. I I can't remember. It was so long ago. And like I during a Warhammer Weekly, I had went like ah, and put my hands up or something, and they turned it into a little wizard picture. And I just thought it was the funniest thing ever. I've got a bunch of little like funny pictures that that I've never had occasion to use. And I thought, oh, what a funny little background to put up for this, uh, you know, for this show. Okay. All right. Uh, Dave. Uh, yep. Add Vallejo Matt Medium. Uh, okay. Okay. Cool. Uh, Marissa. Hey, Vince. What's a good paint brand for beginners? Um, you know, probably Vallejo, I think, is, is where a lot of us get our start. And I think it's a perfectly good paint brand both for beginners and experts i still use a lot of it i mean like there's some of it in my <clears throat> paint area over here on the current project i'm working on uh vallejo is generally pretty commonly available um if you've got like a hobby lobby and patience you can use like because they sell the individual bottles you can go take the 40 percent off coupon once a day that you can use and you can go buy a bottle a day i mean after three weeks you'll have a pretty decent paint collection uh, so I think that's fine. I, I, I like Vallejo. It teaches you, it, it's got a good range of colors between like the model air, the game air, or sorry, the, the model color, the game color, and then the various airlines. Um, and you can, you can experiment with some of the airlines as well. They're naturally thinner. Some of the airlines can really help you if you're just starting out because they are pre thinned for the airbrush, meaning that you'll, you'll just, Thinning your paints and kind of having that kind of control is one of the tougher things when you start. So just using like model air or game air that's already pre-thinned and can more or less go on the model in most cases um, can be a good way to just kind of to, to not have to worry about that and just say, hey, there you go. So yeah, that would be my... It's also a massive, massive, massive range that's widely supported everywhere. It can be ordered from 100 different online retailers and, and it's probably available at many of your local stores. Um, and color matches quite well to, uh, say, like the GW recipes or something you might see online. So, yeah, there you go. All right, Tom Stone. My question is this. I'm painting an Eldar jet bike for 40K. Since Space Elves psychically shape bone to make everything, is there a good way to paint 
black bone that doesn't look burnt? No. <laughs> I mean, if you're doing, if you're like, we as, as sort of humans, again, like there's, you, you have a bunch of priors in your head, right? As to how things look in the world. And it's very hard to disrupt those priors. Um, <clears throat> you can, and, and black, we just associate to the color of char. Now you could gray it out and, and like bone, we will generally see as being a thing. Like we'll recognize something as bone. If it's sort of in the shape of a horn or a skull or something like that, which the Eldar stuff isn't. And it's of this sort of color transition that tends to run from like ivory, hence the name to something darker or, you know, in, in any way, by the way, it can be like, it can go from light to dark or dark to light. It doesn't really matter. Um, the interference color doesn't matter. There's a little mat on my desk. The interference color doesn't really matter. Um, you can, you can like, you can use red as the, the color that's in between that transition between the light and dark blue, green, Brown is the most traditional, obviously, but anything works. We'll recognize all of that as bone. Um, but to make the whole bone very, sort of very, the, very blacked out, will just feel burnt. Um, you could make it very gray, and that would be fine, which might be your answer. You know, up the percentage that's black to like, uh, you could push it toward 50%. Uh, maybe like 40 or 50 percent of the bone is black and then the rest goes into that traditional gray ivory and that kind of thing you may be able to get something like that going um i've never tried without trying to do like bone that's burnt so um but that would be my recommendation just push like the 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 volumes that you set on your bone can mean a lot like how much is light how much is dark um so you could up your your like the black all the way up to like 40 percent of the bone length whatever it happens to be that piece and then still fuzz out into uh and keep it dark but then fuzz out into still the same bright at the end and that might work so maybe give that a try there you go all right nathaniel uh greetings i tried oil washing on a vehicle model but the white spirits ain't through the varnish and three layers of paint job any easy way to mitigate this my god what white spirits were you using were you what what chemical uh, white spirit were you using that it did that? I generally don't even varnish. Okay, so let me just say that. Two, how much white spirits did you have in your brush? I don't know. That could be a thing. Uh, but answer is probably had to do with the white spirit you were using. Might have been a bit too abrasive. Um, so I always use this right here, which you can get in relatively large amounts at relatively low cost. This is the 16 ounce. This is uh, Mona Lisa odorless paint thinner, 100% odorless mineral spirits. It actually is quite odorless. I mean, I don't have much of a sense of smell at all, but even that doesn't really smell like anything. Um, so, you know, and when my wife comes down and I've been working with this stuff, she doesn't go, oh my God, what have you been doing? Um, that was a rude impression, but you get my point. Um the uh because generally she's she's quite sensitive to smells so maybe a different spirit um are you pushing the brush around that could be another thing like when you're working with oil washes you want the brush to just like so lightly touch the model and let the capillary action work for you because oil doesn't have the same surface tension that water does where you know you can you can like take a bead of water and form it up on top of a penny that old trick right Oil doesn't do that. It'll just... So it has like zero surface tension. So you can just like touch it. And that's... Gen if you're like... If you're going like this to put your oil wash on, you're just asking to scrape paint. You need to just like go boop, 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 boop. And just touch it and the oil wash will just spread. It will do its work. So hopefully one of those two things will help you out there. Uh, Fulcrum, uh, living in Germany, middle European time zone. And finally, I was able to catch one of these live while painting. Awesome. Yeah. I like to sort of vary the time. And I know that like doing this at noon is kind of better for a lot of the European folks, because this is somewhere between five and probably seven or 8 PM for a lot of you. So, um, hopefully this is more convenient. Uh, 
All right, Matt. Well, thank you very much, Matt. I appreciate that you that you, uh, that you enjoy the models. Um, w. Soren of oh, picking up on the previous one. There's a bit of purple brown pinks in the mix. Assuming the frost giant does have, uh, assuming the frost giant does not have red blood, what would you recommend the highlight colors would be? Why wouldn't she have red blood? She still could. Just like use red tones, right? Like in general, it's what we see uh, again to unpack priors. Like. I understand that we think frost giants might not have red blood, but because they have blue skin or whatever, and they're, they're, they're you know, sort of otherworldly creatures. Um, but just use red tones anyways. We as humans have an amazing amount of prior knowledge that red equals blood and life and warmth. And when that goes away, we don't see those things anymore. So like highlight colors, <coughs> well... You know, there'd be sort of a mid-tone. I would use some kind of pink, red, softly, like like the artist did in the around the veins where you see it most and in the elbows and stuff. But just some kind of skin tone, some kind of sunny skin tone of some kind. Anything will work. Any relatively bright skin tone. So, like, if you want a nice thing to set your, your anchor to, there you go. This is sunny skin tone from Vallejo Model Color. This. Something in this neighborhood, and you're in the right place. <clears throat> for your frost giant all right Devin, with your suggestion that you don't varnish metals i find that my metallics get rubbed off a lot what metallics are you using that they get rubbed off and how are and how are they getting rubbed off um thoughts on the idea of doing a metallic base coat varnishing then painting the base coat again sure you could do that i i have never had metal rub off a miniature and i i don't varnish any metals what are you doing? <laughs> are you like, are you grabbing your model like this? Are you transporting in foam? What metal paint are you using? I have follow-up questions. So all these things could be impactful. Uh, Matt S., I'm trying to recreate the same turquoise on your Slanesh models and find the whole Drubulu very challenging to work with. It acts almost like an oil paint. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, Holder I always thought was actually kind of thin. Um, it's more like, a, it's just almost glazy right from the beginning. Um, where are you having a challenge? We'll see. We'll see. Tell me, tell me what you're running into there. Uh, all right. Uh, Sini had was just kind of talking about how use a mix, the primary lights and the skin color is the highlight for usual skin, unusual skin colors. I agree with that completely. Yep. Uh, Bethany, Hey, it's 2 AM, but caught this. Is there a review of the new Scale 75 tube paints coming soon? Yeah, you know, I recorded one, actually. And I'm just kind of sitting on it, because I'm not sure I'm happy with it. Um, like, I like them. I just, like, they're weird because they're not commercially available, I don't think. Like, I tried to look and see. And my perception of them is that they're expensive because of the Kickstarter. Like, vis-a-vis -vis compared to, say, a normal paint or to, like to go buying a tube of heavy body acrylic. But I don't know if that's actually fair, and I'd be afraid I was saying something incorrect. So I, I'm going to think about it, Bethany. I have a review. Short answer, I like the paints. Long answer, I don't know that they're actually doing anything that much different than a heavy body acrylic, traditional like that you'd buy at an art store, except that they are very matte, which I do appreciate. That is really nice. But they have a lot of the similar functions. Okay. Michael Anderson, I applied Wraithbone primer to my mini and tried to apply Wildwood contrast to the paint. It started to beat up, beat up rather than apply to the model. Did I do something wrong? Sounds like you just didn't get the contrast shook enough beforehand. Um, like, the, it sounds like there was too much medium. The contrast paints are really, really chemically unstable because of this weird Frankensteinian mix of paints they had to use to make this all work like it is. So, like, if you just grabbed the pot and then started applying it, it's very likely you had separation and you had too much flow improver and medium and not enough actual pigment. And so it's just going to go and, like, spread out. So shake the living bejesus out of it. And I suspect you won't have that problem. Because what's happening there is it's, it's, there's too much flow improver that, that, let, that like, no surface tension can form. <clears throat> okay. So that's a, that's a potential. Um, Nathaniel also said you might need to wick off the excess. That's also true. You might just have too much of it and it might be beating up. That's a, that's a great point. Uh, Nathaniel, that could also be correct. Uh, all right. Kelly audio. 
I hope you're well. Can you talk about including pop colors in your mini? Oh, I would love to talk about that. Pop colors are awesome. So pop colors are, let's, I, I want to establish the standard terminology. I, I use this in the PMP reviews. So I want to, I want to make sure that I, I get this going. So pop colors have, let, let's just say there are five colors to your miniature. One is your highest highlight, five is your deepest shade, three is your midtone, and then two and four are the the intersection of those. So like two is the the you know the middle point between your midtone and your highlight, and four is the middle point between your shade and your midtone. That's not an accurate reflection of what actually happens, but it's easy enough just to to have a shorthand to talk about. Okay. So five colors. Five is the deepest shade, one is the brightest highlight. Everybody with me? Great. Okay, a pop color travels in between generally two and one, and it's a nearby but different color that's meant to capture light pollution or to create visual interest. Um, the most common, if you want, if you go look, let's take a look at, let's go look at some of David Soper's work because that will be a good example of what pop colors are because David Soper is an absolute master of them. Here we are. Uh, we're going to open this in a new tab and then pull that tab out. So we, oh my gosh, that, why is that so small? Okay, sorry. Let me find a bigger version of that. Hey, that one done? No, that's not done. Aha. Aha. Okay. Sorry, folks. There's a nice big gut rot spume. Good old goody. There he is. All right. So Soper's a master of pop colors. <clears throat> The other place pop colors can hide is in shadows. So you will see a lot of artists use them down in the five to add color back to the deepest shade. So let's take a look at David's work here. So what he's got here is a teal transition, much like we were talking about earlier with a deep shade that goes into blue, black, up through teal and into a white highlight. But what he's done is he's added this yellow in here as a pop color. And you can see how this yellow green is suddenly in the mix. It's not part of this color transition, right? Like you could get rid of all this yellow green and have a perfectly viable color transition um, in here. He also did it up here, in, but in the other, the other way I was talking about where he hid it in the shadows. So here in the shadows of the tines of the trident, you can see how he's taken this bright blue green. And again, this could just be the shadow of non-metallic metal. It could just be black or dark. And you can see how a lot of that's in there. But instead, he hid this blue-green down here, right? Now, there's no real reason for that to be there. Like, yes, it's the oxidation, but why would it only oxidize in the shadows? So it's not realistic, but it's artistic. And, and very often, pop colors serve that kind of a function. Our, our goal here in miniature painting is not to create some perfect facsimile of reality. Um, that's not actually what we're on about um what we're on about is trying to make our miniatures visually interesting and we need to conform enough to reality that the human eye and all the priors we bring to it don't go whoa what is that that's that doesn't make any sense i don't like that right um but we don't need to be slaves to it at the same time uh and so you know you can do stuff like that so pop colors are, are great for things like hair um, and stuff like that. So going back to, you know, like the model here, um, you know, you could have pop colors. They'd be occur about here on that model, right? Where uh, you have this other color kind of that doesn't really need to be there in there. Um, that's the kind of place where you put pop colors. And you're generally going to use something adjacent. Like here, I would probably use maybe a yellow or a green or something like that just to catch the eye, to catch a color. Here in the pink, um, you might use like uh, like a purple. You might use something like a, a, a soft yellow to kind of add that light. Um, so there's different kinds of options. You just kind of got to feel it out and think, what's going to make this look visually interesting? Okay. Uh, Rayhan, I watched your video on the Iron Jaws. You dry brush with white. Can I do it with flesh color, flesh color for purple? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Flesh color is a great thing to do that kind of highlight with for purple. Yes. 
Uh, it'll also make your blending later on a lot smoother. So absolutely. A, yeah, 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 100%. Just get a nice, you know, a, a nice flesh color that's going to dry brush on well, i.e. don't use something too liquidy or thin. All right. Uh, Devin, if I remember correctly, you've suggested that we should only paint base rims in black. Correct. Uh, I've seen a number of well-painted models that have neutral color based on the finish base. Why should we stick with only black? Because black creates the hardest separation between your model and the rest of the universe, and it's the one that looks visually the most appealing because it creates the highest contrast point between your miniature and the rest of the world that it isn't that isn't part of the miniature's world. The miniature's world stops at the rim of the base, and everything outside of that is the real world. But what's sitting on that base is the miniature. So, like not to disagree with Darren Latham, who I just saw did a basing video and did it in brown, but I'm going to disagree with him. Bases can be in any color you want, as long as they're black. GW's paint schemes would generally look so much better if they would just black rim their bases. They continue to do that brown base, and it just looks bad. Guys, I don't know why you're doing it. Just black rim the base. It should be black. Um, and obviously, like, I understand people have some taste for goblin green and stuff like that because it's 80s, yo. Uh, no, that looks terrible. Um, straight up terrible. Um, if you're that deep in the nostalgia waters, somebody needs to throw you a somebody needs to throw you a life preserver uh, because you're going to drown in those waters. Um, but the, the short answer is that it's the same reason display plinths tend to be black unless that they're natural wood because they're going to work well with the colors of the bust or something like that of the piece. Um, it's the same reason that picture frames tend to be black, right? Like. We don't go buy brown colored picture frames. Go to go to Joanne Fabrics or Michaels or something and ask them to ask to see their wide selection of earth colored picture frames. Okay. All right. Have I beat this dog enough? All right. Cool. Uh Oh, well thank you Greg. That's very nice. I appreciate that. Uh Sai um, speaking of the German gray, what brand is it? Grab some of the Vallejo Panzer gray primer, but that's a primer. Yeah, that's, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about like the primer is the German, the German Panzer gray. It's, I don't know what the name is. I always forget it, but it's this one. Yeah. German Panzer gray. That is my standard primer just for my, you know, this is what all models get primed in first. This is coat the first of everything I do. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a fun picture, the sorcerer. That's that's me. That's me bringing you the hobby magic. Uh, all right. Let's see. Where are we at? Oh boy, I'm behind. I got to speak. I got to hurry up. All right. I just I get going and I like to answer these questions in detail. Sini. Hi, Vince. Thanks to your encouragement. Got yourself an airbrush. Awesome. Liking it so far, despite the learning curve. Just wish I had a paint booth for indoors. Outside is getting too cold to paint. Um, you just need a cardboard box. Sini. That's all you need. Get yourself a cardboard box. As long as you're only spray spraying acrylic paints, just put it, cut out the back. Put a little piece of filter on it, like a cheap piece of filter you buy or some cheesecloth or something like that, so air can go out the back. And that's it. Like, that's all you need. And then if you want to take the step up from there... Go on to like Amazon or whatever, and they have a little portable airbrush booth that has a little fan on the back that'll draw the air through, and you're fine. That's all you need. But but seriously, you can just use a cardboard box in the house. Um, I mean, I've taught many classes airbrushing. I don't even use that. I'm sitting on a desk uh, when I do two-day paint sessions. Myself and 20 students are sitting around in a game shop, and we're just painting with our airbrush on a desk. Like, obviously, we laid down a little... Um, so they make these little potty pads, these little puppy potty pads. Um, if you're trying to keep your space clean, those are really good. You can buy like big bulk packs of those pretty cheap. And you can just save that down in an area and then go nuts. You're not going to get paint anywhere because you're, you're on the puppy potty pad. That's a fun thing to say. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to create a summoning portal as a bent circle. Any suggestions on how to make it? I tried plastic card, but it won't bend. Wow. That's a strange question. On a as a bent circle. Stretched cone. I know I'm not sure I can picture exactly what you're saying, but 
do you mean like you want a tube thing going like whoop and like stretched out like that? I don't know. Like I'm picturing like the the thing on the old timey, uh, you know, record players from like the early 1900s or whatever is what you're trying to describe. Uh, the answer is get yourself a heat gun or something like that. Then you'll be able to bend. Uh, you, if you heat up plastic card, it'll bend and you can reshape it. Um, so I do that with models a lot. You just get a little heat gun. They're actually not that expensive. It's kind of a fun thing to play around with. They will get super hot, so don't burn yourself. And uh, and then you can just bend the plastic card in shape. That's usually what I find to be the easiest thing. Uh, all right. Well, thanks, Steph. I, I like both versions. I just I wanted this one to be very female. Uh, talking about the fact that I reshaped the chest of this particular keeper. I, I, I like both of those versions. I just wanted this one to be very female. Uh, Nathaniel. Uh, yep, okay, cool. Uh, Emily. <laughs> uh, yes, absolutely. All right. Let's see. Joe Orthaber. Hey, from Orthaber Studios. What's up, Joe? Uh, Joe is a great craftsman and makes amazing things as well as being a cool artist. My, like, favorite paint handle was made by Joe. And you can see my little Imperial Fist is on it right now. So there you go. Thanks, Joe. All right, let's see. Uh, John Chaves. Uh, I'm trying to up armor my 40K Imperial Guard Sentinel as a way to differentiate the armored from the scout by adding bits. Is there a way to paint on extra armor? I mean, sure. You could freehand extra armor plates, but it would be really annoying. So instead, let me give you a simpler option. Go buy yourself some plastic card, the thick variety. Okay? And get yourself some plastic card and the little the little plastic card, like, uh, they're not tubes, but it's just like little sticks. You can order them in little packs. Get yourself those two things. These are useful to have in general, by the way, so it's not just for this project. Like, having plastic card around in general is quite valuable. And then the little plastic card, they're like poles. I don't know how else to say it. Rods, plastic card rods. That's probably the right thing. And um, you can buy these from most, like, hobby stores um, if, they, if, they're, if they have scale modeling stuff because these are very popular in scale modeling. So you want a decent-ish thickness. I couldn't tell you exactly, but I tend to buy multi-packs and just find the ones that work. Cut yourself a nice solid square. Bing, bing, bing. Glue that to the side of some armor plate. Then you take the little tube, the little rod, and you cut four tiny little itty-bitty baby pieces off. Just like, droop, the tiniest little piece. And then you put those in the four corners like rivets. And ta-da! Armor plate. Like, that will read right there. It's going to have a sharp edge. It's going to be roughly square. It'll have four rivets in it. That is now an armor plate. So... There you go. That's my best advice. Uh, oh, well, thanks, Al. I appreciate that. Always happy to help. Uh, oh, two Al's back to back. All right. Uh, Al Delis, uh, would you ever do a tutorial for black non-metallic metal? Um, yes, uh, I am. I am going to. It's on my list at some point. It's really annoying to warn you in advance. So, you know, settle in. It's one of the reasons, that, like, you will never see me paint an army where the primary color is black. Will not happen. It is very hard to make it look good. And it's boring visually unless you do a lot of work with it. But yes, I will do that video. Uh, all right. <laughs> very funny skunk. Uh, I'm S Stuart Bruce. Uh, I'm looking to get a lizard. I'm struggling to get a lizard color when doing a lizard. When doing lizard men, any tips? Define lizard color. I mean, any green, green, blue, green, brown, green, brown, yellow will generally feel lizardy. What are you running up against? Uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, Matt S. It could just be my bottle of Holder Blue, but it's very thick and pigmented, not glazed at all. I love the color and want to make it work. Do you base with that color first and then add the highlight? Um, I usually use a mix of that and Amharth blue as my as my midtone, and then Huldra is my four, and uh, Payne's gray is my five. Um, but that's a strange bottle. Yeah, you might have a bad bottle there, man. 
Um, you may want to try to decant that into a different bottle and add some medium. So you can get like these 30 mil bottles pretty cheap off Amazon. So you could get a thing like that. Um, I just moved over. I, I just, I, there's some Citadel paints that I, I like, just a few colors, but I decanted them into these big bottles. So that way we have a bunch of them. Like Bugman's Glow is just an interesting color. It's quite useful in a bunch of interesting ways. Um, that kind of stuff. So you may want to try something like that. Add some more medium. See if maybe that helps. Because that is weird. Um, every every I've bought a couple different bottles of Halder Blue in my time. And they've all been pretty thin, to be honest. So might just be a bad bottle. Uh, Nathaniel, you schminky white spirit, but upon your guess, I reckon there's too much solvent in the brush. Need to verify. Okay, cool. Well, we'll see how it works out, man. Keep, keep me in the loop and ping me anytime. I'm happy to help. Uh, Devin, I'm using Vallejo, which, which VMC? Cause that could mean Vallejo model color or it could v mean Vallejo metal color. We generally abbreviate Devin. We generally abbreviate Vallejo metal color as VM little EC. That way I know what you're talking about. Uh, it's specifically the tips of the spiky bits that paint rub off from gameplay. I do live in a very low humidity city. Maybe in effect. Could be. I don't know. It's, I have zero humidity down here. My water evaporates instantaneously. Um, but you know, my answer is if you're, if you're finding a little bit of it rubbing off from gameplay, yeah, you may want to varnish that and then just like, and then just redo some of the metal. It might be necessary. Um, I, I haven't experienced the same thing, but uh, but I completely believe you. So, you know, that might be what's going on. Uh, Matt S, uh, a step-by-step -step on how you do your turquoise. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different colors of, of turquoise I'll work with, and it's actually usually more blue. A lot of times, if you mean like on Slanesh, a lot of times people will be like, uh, you know, how did you do your, your turquoise? And I'm like, well, I used a bunch of blues. Um, Okay, so let's just do this. You can all you can all look at my my schema here. Uh, let's go to Slanesh. There you go. So I assume what you're asking about is something like this, right? How I did that color. Um, this is the other keeper of secrets, or one of my other ones. Uh, yeah. So I mean, it's this was. A little bit of Haldra, like I said, in the blow areas. And then I actually used Adriatic blue and a little bit of uh, white for the highlights. And then just some Payne's gray for the low tones. Um, I mixed in a little bit of purple ink here and there to just add a little bit of visual interest to the shadows. But it's like the step-by-step -step is, is pretty straightforward. It starts with a wet blend. Like I just, I get all those colors out together on the palette and I just start going nuts. So it'll look like white, Adriatic, Holdra, Payne's Gray. And I just start wet blending the crap out of stuff and then just refine it down. That's more or less all it is to it because um, it's a pretty simple color transition. I use the low tones to correct and smooth because they're very transparent. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's pretty much it. I hope that helps. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, Dave, how would you ready a heavy body acrylic paint such as the Vallejo Studio range, e.g. number 22 that come in big bottles? I don't know. I, I don't buy all my heavy body acrylics I buy come in tubes. So I buy like the golden stuff like this. And I don't do anything to it. I just literally get it out of the tube um and paint with it that's it i don't do anything else with it um yeah it's it doesn't require anything it's it's good to go it requires being put onto a wet palette and then paint it is quite thick and that's a that's an that's a that's a feature not a bug um people are generally very afraid of using thick paint they need to not be you just paint on the miniature so like the technique you see me use in the video for when not to thin your paints it's the, that's what I use with this. I'll put a big old glob onto the miniature and then just start smoothing it around. It stays wet for quite a while when it's quite thick. So you have a really long working time. Um, but yeah, that's what.
Okay, how long have I been muted? Goodness sakes, I sat on my mute button. Well, that's fun. Uh, you're correct, I didn't notice for ages. Oh boy. Sorry, everybody. That really is terrible. I'm so sorry. I hope I wasn't muted for very long. Uh, okay. I sat on the mute button on my microphone. That is terrible. I have no idea how many questions I missed there. I really hope it wasn't long. Uh, gosh, that's terrible. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, okay. I'll try to answer what I did quickly. How do you get red to pop? You put white over it and get the white to shine up through. Um, can everybody, I, I, hopefully everybody can hear me again. It should be okay now. Uh, yes, it's capturing my audio again. I'm so sorry, guys. Uh, let's see. And then, uh, plague monks and having trouble making the back of the robe look interesting. So what I was saying was you would want to paint some mud that flaps up on it, like use wildwood or agrarian student or some contrast. Do that on the bottom, flick some mud up onto it. Um, you could manually paint stitches, which is just a thin line, and then cross hatches, and then you put some white in the middle. You could do some hashes, scratches, and, and slashes like Sam Lenz does, stuff like that. All right. I'm so sorry, everybody. Since talking about white paint. Okay. Oof. All right. Uh, five minutes. All right. Well, there you go. All right. Uh, I suspect you're just not caught up, Al, but we'll see what happens there. All right, we got to start moving through some questions. Al, that is just... Jeez, old Pete's. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll go a little extra time today. That's going to be annoying in the middle, so sorry. Uh, but we'll go a little longer today. All right, TD. Hey, Vince, any tips for non-metallic style and true metallic surfaces composed of several small elements, e.g., scale mail from Phoenix Guard? How do you set up the desk lights for painting TMM? I find it hard to see. A good bright light over top of you and, you know, like, it's exactly what you would expect. You want to, like, rim each little scale and and have a nice dark point coming down toward the center or up toward the top. You can you can play with the light reflections in either direction. Um, but it's, it's effectively the same thing. It, it doesn't, you know, like you, with little scales, it's easy because you don't have to blend as much. Um, but you, uh, but you still have to it's still just like silver. Let's just take steel for a second. Silver around the edge. And then like, let's say your dark was at the bottom, then that should be black and fade up to a bright silver point at the top of the scale. And you kind of do that on each scale. It's not, it's, it's time consuming ish. It's just a lot of little touches, but it's not a lot of blending. There you go. Hopefully that helps. Um, but yeah, I use like an architect light, like a long flat architect light. That's bright and set it, uh, like a 5,000 or whatever. So it's, pretty good it's a nice neutral light uh what are your thoughts on a brick pavement style base for a skaven army i'm pro that that's fine just do other stuff besides brick like don't just make it brick because assumingly they're walking you're having them invading a city so do other stuff that would be in cities put barrels on the bases and crates and have spots that are broken and sewer tunnel entrances and stuff like that like it's a good idea just take it all the way I, I have a Skaven actually based, and I, I did one in like a brick thing. And yeah, it, it's cool. You just want to make sure you do enough stuff. Uh, in fact, do, 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 do. All right. Let's see if we can find him real quick. There's a lot of scaven in here. I think this is going to be useful because somebody asked me a question a little earlier about where, uh, nope. Mm, I don't know where he is. Too many scaven pictures over too much time. Oh, nope, there he is right there. Ha ha. Found him. There you go. So he's brick, right? But he, you know, I've got little barrels and wood planks and stuff like that. So that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Uh, the reason they use brown or others is because the base is designed. The reason. Okay, so Cliff is saying the reason that GW uses brown or other neutral colors is because the base is designed the GW case to be set on a board. In this case, you don't want the base to contrast with what it's sitting on. I guess. I. I, I mean, I guess I still think it looks bad when you're looking at the model. And 
that that's fine. But unfortunately, 90% of people's interaction with GW models is looking at that model alone on the website. So there you go. Uh, what are your thoughts on alcohol inks? Uh, haven't used any, so I can't say. In general, alcohol paints are fine. I can't think of any time I've used alcohol inks. Um, I've used a lot of like liquid gold and stuff like that. So, yep. Uh, oh, there you go. Yeah, Forge of Wonders. Has, absolutely great, great tip. Uh, the Green Stuff World has some great brick textured rollers that have some other interesting things going on in them too. Good call. Good call, Kieran. Uh, Power Wolf. Uh, recently got back into painting again. Love your vids. Thank you. Um, full of stuff that's rarely mentioned. Uh, some might say long winded. <laughs> oh, they're definitely that. Not some might say, I might say I am long winded, but I just, I feel the need to go into the detail to really kind of show people what's happening behind the scenes. I'm not, I'm not like a, I'm not one of those people that's like, and look, here's a, here's a fixed finished cake. Like, whoa, hold on. There was some other stuff that happened there. Uh, Oh, nice. Brian S. says if you don't have a heat gun, you can kind of use the heat above your stove to bend it. That's a good call. Just be careful. Yes, don't burn yourself. Uh, I cannot support that at all, John. I cannot. Uh, using different colors for, for like, metallic colors? No, you don't want to draw attention to a base ever. I am, I am wholly against that. Uh, I'm sorry. I cannot support that. All right. Uh, JTS, uh, I'm miniature. I, I'm painting a miniature in a moonlit style light. Any ideas how you would paint? Yeah, sure. You add, yeah, yeah. How, so how do you do Caucasian skin tone in the moonlight? Sure. Well, number one, just Google pictures of people at night and try to figure out the level you want to actually capture it in. Um, but yeah, you fade it out by adding blue white. So that's where you get out your old friend. Ah, your old friend glacier blue. This is your, that's, you know, your highlight. You, you integrate blue into it, um, as well as into the shadows. Now, ironically, you want to warm up your shadows a little bit. You want to bring a little, like, whole red and stuff into the shadows because when you make the entire skin tone uh, cold like that, you want to then have the shadows be warm. But, yeah, just integrate in some light blue, white, gray with your, uh, with your normal flesh tones, and that's pretty much what you got to do. Um... Devin says, I find wet blending difficult. I feel like I have to work super fast or have so much flow improver that makes coverage bad. Thoughts? Don't use flow improver. You don't want to do that. That will make coverage bad. You want retardant, which will not do that. Um, or to use more paint and thicker paint. If you're wet blending, you shouldn't be thinning your paint. You want it to be thicker. You want more of it. Um, and then you want to spread it out. Um, brand can also matter. Like Things like Pro Acryl and Scale especially original flavor scale, will generally wet blend a lot better. So some of that stuff might all help. Uh, Dan, watched your Van Gogh video. Do you think it's possible to use intentionally messy blends to create a to create that post-impressions feel on a mini? Um, yeah, sure. Um, check out Anthony Rodriguez. <coughs> so it's Pirate Monkey Painting. We're going to do an interview with him sometime. I think, I think we have him scheduled out for early next month. And... But he's great at that. He's done a bunch of impressionistic pieces that are awesome. So go look up Pirate Monkey Painting, and you'll see exactly. He he very much was inspired by the Impressionists and did some really great work. Uh, <clears throat> um, what armies would it work for? I, any, sort of any that you felt were, were good. I mean, th certain things need to feel clean, I suppose. But as long as the whole army was in that style... I don't know that you're going to win any like painting competitions at a, at a, at a army, at, you know, that many people are judging because there's sort of a, there's sort of this predisposition toward a certain style, but I think it'd be awesome. Uh, I wouldn't judge you negatively if I was judging the event, as long as you executed on it really well. Um, so there you go. Uh, get, uh, yeah, get to have, um, uh, who can you follow to figure out how to paint the P3 storm Raptor? It's a giant bird with lots of feathers. Um, well, I have some videos on doing detailed feathers, so you may want to go back and check that out. But effectively, it can just be as easy as a lot of like dry brushing and glazing in of different colors. Shouldn't be too much trickier. Uh, all right, Josh Arden, uh, where can I find pictures of your warp knot vermin lord? Ha ha! Um, on Twitter and and things like that. But I knew I had this folder open for a reason. <laughs> All right, where are you at, dum-dum? You're in here somewhere. There he is. 
so yeah, this was the warp now of Vermilord. You can see we did the, the grate in the ground and the rats coming up out of it and integrated that into the arcane ruins. There you go. That's the actual ground the rats are coming up out of. So that's fun. Yeah, but there you go. I added some fur to him because I really wasn't happy with big giant naked rat I think looks so stupid. So I added fur, that kind of thing. There you go. That's him. All right. Uh, Marissa Shear, what are excellent beginner hobby tools and supplies? Um, yes, hobby cheating zero one. Like literally the first one is basic cheats and time saver and is a bunch of tools that you're, that are useful. Um, but like beginner tools, you know, you need a good like, <clears throat> you need a good sharp knife for cutting. You need a good solid pair of clippers for clipping. Um, you know, you need some up, uh, you need probably uh, some decent brushes that you'll beat up and, and, and mess up. Um, <clears throat> Beyond that, uh, like if you want to get a simple wet palette made or something, that's a pretty good thing to have at the very beginning. Um, something for brush cleaner. So just, you know, go and get yourself some brush cleaner of some kind so you don't ruin your brushes. Good old fashioned, uh, the master's brush cleaner and preserver is a pretty good one. You can buy this at any art store or order it online. You can see how that's mine. It's all worn down. This is the second one I've gone through. I try to clean my brushes pretty regularly. You can also just use shampoo and stuff or brushes, by the by. Um, everything else is, you know, like there's all stuff like there's tons of good tools. You want some kind of painting handle that can be as easy as an old bottle of paint that you just put some blue tack on top of or a cork or something like that. You know, something you can hold. You don't want to be holding miniatures. You never, ever, 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 ever want to be holding the miniature you're painting. Not just because you might rub the paint. But because uh, off, which is bad, but because it causes an incredible amount of stress on your hand to put your hand in a stress position like that, your hand just let, like relax all the muscles in your hand and your hand will sit like that, right? Just when you're not flexing anything. So you want something that fits into that position. That way your hand is exerting the least amount of force at any point in time. That's probably some of the more important stuff. Yeah. But that, that video, check it out. Zero one. Uh, Stuart. Uh, he says that the blue is too dark. I mm, use more of a transition and a highlight, I guess, would be my answer. Um, I mean, you may want to grab more of a green blue at your highlight. That could be a way because you maybe you feel like they, like think more of like that. That um, that uh, gut rot spume we looked at earlier where he's kind of uh, has that kind of green bluey stuff. You could try dry brushing some of that. Lizards have very textured skins. So you could you could use that green blue on top. That will not make them feel like ultramarines. So maybe check out some kind of tealy color to dry brush in as a highlight or something. That might help you. Uh, what line of paints would you generally suggest to learn wet blending? Wet blending. Pro acryl. Easy. Easy, easy, easy. Okay, good man, Devin. Glad to hear that. Okay, he's using Vallejo Metal Color. Yes. Uh, all right. All right, awesome. Shanus, uh, Shanu. I don't know how to say that. Uh, don't have any questions, just want to give your appreci appreciation for the hobby cheating videos. Well, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, is there a Payne's Gray in a model paint range? Um... Abyssal Blue from Scale 75 is pretty close. It's a pretty blue-black. But, I mean, I, it's, I can't think of anything else that's exactly like it. I'm just, like, looking around at all the paints and trying to think. Probably not, but I wouldn't try to replace it. Like, Payne's Gray is Payne's Gray. It has other unique properties. Like, being an ink is part of what makes it valuable. It is a worthwhile pickup. One of the best things you can do is to go buy yourself three bottles of ink. Dalarowney FW Payne's Gray, Dalarowney Burnt Umber or, or uh, Sepia. Either one of those two is fine. Like some kind of brown. 
and then Dalarani FW white ink, or there's also like Vallejo makes a white ink. The the artist uh, acrylic artist ink from Vallejo, sorry, Boop. there you go, is also real good. Those three things will change your hobby life. Every I I wish when you like started the hobby and got your new painter kit, they just gave you those three inks and said, trust me, you're gonna need these. Devin, how long do you like primer cure before painting? Uh, three minutes. The amount of time it takes me to go walk over, usually go to the restroom, maybe look at a video or something real quick. You know, something like that. So that's all. That's all the time it takes. Uh, I, I, I asked Angel Geraldes this once, and, you know, he works with Vallejo. He is a master painter with an airbrush. I, I asked him, like, how long do you let your primer cure? And he looked at me like I was a, a crazy person. Like, he's, he's like, I don't know, a couple minutes, however long it takes me to clean the brush and go get my next paint ready was basically his answer. So there you go. All right. Muted, 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 muted. Uh, do, do, do. Okay. Mute, mute. I'm just trying to go through all the time I was muting. All right. Uh, do, 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 do. Wow. Okay. Hey, there we go. All right. Caught back up. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Uh, all right. Matthias. Uh, when you get to read this, your next question is mine about the fire slayers as allies. Oh, okay, sure, Matthias. Yeah, the answer is just tie in the colors in some way. So, like, uh, to reiterate the earlier question. Um, if, you know, whatever you used for, like, the shoulders or the tabard on your Stormcast, use that for the cloth and stuff on your fire slayers. Um, you could use verdigris on their hair if you have verdigris. That sounds crazy, but, you know, make it like a green in your highlights or the verdigris color. Um, make it the same copper that there they have the same copper metal stuff like that and they'll feel tight in it doesn't take much to make an army feel tight in okay all right all right there we go so we got his question answered all right steven uh, oh, that's cool. Black Magic Craft just did a video that included how to make a custom roller. That's kind of cool. I'll have to check that out. Um, w. Soren, what are your thoughts on the dissonance of your art being too close to reality without it, without being believable? What are your thoughts on the dissonance of your art being? I'm not sure what you mean there. I've never thought about it, I guess is the answer. Like, in general miniature painting, you're going for, like, real enough and understanding what priors people are going to deploy what preconceived notions they bring to the table. Um, it's it's Neo, or it's not Neo, sorry, it's Morpheus from the Matrix, right? Uh, this world has rules. Some of these rules can be bent. Others can be broken, right? Like, that's you just have to figure out what those rules are, and then, uh, uh, then you know, you can, you can do cool stuff. Like, like, jump real far and... Sweet ninja kicks. That's what. That's actually the next high level of miniature painting. A lot of people don't realize that. But if you paint long enough, you can just like jump across skyscrapers and do sweet ninja kicks. It's totally true. Uh, all right, Ben. I recently had a crack at brush steel and wasn't happy with the result. Wondering if you or anyone had tips for that. Thousands of thin lines. You need an extremely sharp brush and you just keep working it and then you glaze over the top, either with your brush or your airbrush. I have a brush steel video in non-metallic metal. Um, I've also, if you look at the poisoned weapons video, I do it with true metallic metal. So you can do it with either if you're using Vallejo metal color, but the answer is just more lines. Like you have to just little tiny hashes that you're just doing back and forth and 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 back and forth. And if that's annoying and sounds like it's a long time, I really mean it you got to keep doing them over and over and over again. And then eventually you just glaze to bring it all together to some degree because you only want that texture to kind of show through. You're like trying to hit this magical middle section. 
Steph, any future tutorial on rat fur? Um, no, but I've done fur before. Is there something I didn't cover in the previous fur videos you wanted to see? Uh, any channel recommendations for sculpting minis? No, I, well, Traverian does some sculpting. He's got some cool videos on his sculpting process, so you might want to check that out. Traver, uh, T-R-O-V-A-R-I-O-N. He was one of the top three finalists in the Ever Chosen. Way to go, buddy. Uh, that's awesome. Good for, like, I'm so excited that his, uh, his, whichever, whichever Nurgle, Lord of Blight, Pestilence, Plague, whatever, I don't know what their names, whichever one he did that was awesome. It looked great, so I was happy to see him make the top three. Um, but he has some sculpting videos, because he's also a sculptor. Um, but no, it's outside of my area. I, I took a two-day sculpting uh, workshop once where we sculpted sort of a figure from scratch and um, and realized that I hated it and never wanted to do it again. Um, so there you go. Um, what grit sandpaper is good for sanding plastic? I keep some 400 and some 800 around. Um, so I go to the auto store, like the auto parts store, and I buy the 3M. I don't know why I keep showing this screen. This isn't the screen. This is the screen, Vince. So I buy the three the three M Auto eight hundred and uh, this one's the eight hundred, but I buy the eight hundred and the four hundred, and I find those give you a pretty nice smooth uh, sand on your plastic. Uh, all right, devs and dice. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I'm glad the videos are helpful. Uh, that's awesome to hear. Uh, Will Wyatt, what do you recommend for thinning down inks to airbrush as a filter? Uh, but it, so for Dalla Rowney or something like that, uh, or similar type of pigmented inks, between 8 and 10 to 1, thinner to ink. Um, you'll actually see a video on that coming very soon. Uh, Nick Larking, how, how is your wall of paints organized? You sort them by brand, colors, or some other way. Uh, brand and then color that is how i sort them out um i have a very specific system so like certain all the paints are organized like this is the scale one right here and this is the vallejo one right here and this one is war colors and reaper and a little gw that one is pro acryl and the war colors nostalgia as well as like some nocturna stuff like i'm just the the uh contrast stuff's all up there so you know just, i have a lot of racks i mean i have this is my game air rack over here. I have one, two, three, four, five, six full size paint racks, all of which hold between 60 and 120 paints, as well as a bunch of little ones. So, yeah, I like paint. I actually just did a purge, getting rid of some of the ones I don't use to add some different ones in. So, there you go. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> uh, want to do Zenithal Priming with my Stormcast painting the armor gold? I don't and can't find Badger metal color set, but I'm using Vallejo metal color gold. Would for, would FW inks be a good substitute? Yes, absolutely. A hundred percent they would. Um, yeah, I, I thank you for clarifying. It did take me a second, but I got to where you're going for adding darker and lighter shades. Yes, a hundred percent. Get yourself some Vallejo. Like, honestly, I, I have a video on doing quick storm cast with inks. It's maybe like hobby cheating 104, somewhere in the early hundreds. But I like a three to one mixture of gold to copper. Three gold, one copper. That's my perfect gold. And then, yeah, absolutely, the FW inks are great to do some extra color on those. <coughs> okay. Um, oh, there you go. Uh, sanding paper, yep, tweezers, paper clips. Oh, paper clips. How could I forget paper clips? Thank you, Nathaniel. That's great. Masking tape, yep. There you go. Yeah, super glue, some kind of cement, yep. Any good colors for Verdaccio underpainting? Oh, that's a great question. So Verdaccio is this, for those who don't know, is um, a method used by a lot of traditional canvas artists to paint flesh, where you sketch the, the flesh in various tones of green, and then um, and then you lay the flesh tone over it, and it will give you this wonderful transition because the green of the Verdaccio plus, and the yellow of the green plus the pink of such of the skin equals these wonderful rich tones. And yes... My answer is Fantasy and Games makes like an orc line, I think, that's actually really good for this. Um, so they have a couple of green-yellow colors. Uh, I think it's like, it's Scale 75 Fantasy and Games. I want to say it's like orcs or shades of orcs or something like that. But it has a bunch of different interesting shades of green-yellows that are really, really good 
for Verdaccio. Um, they go through the airbrush pretty easy. Um, that's that's what I've done when I've done my Verdaccio work in the past. Uh, yep. Uh, what do you personally find yourself using Payne's Gray for the most? Everything. Everything. So, yeah, let's let's break it down. Uh, I mix it in to get cold shadows. So I'll use a little bit of it into whatever color to cool out the shadows. Um, I'll use it to mix with a little brown or something to add an environmental shade or color to something. I'll use it to do thin black lines. I'll use it to black line in between miniatures to add deep recesses. So like uh, as part of my low tone on non-metallic metal. So like on the Space Marine here where he has all those little pieces and stuff, you know, in like the, the vents and stuff in his armor. That's all that. The back on the tubes in his legs, like the lines in between each tube, you know, all of that was that. On the sword, right, on the sort of magic sword, a little bit of that is the shade for the low color. All over the place. Anytime I'm doing a cold shadow or low light, it's it's my go-to. Uh... Okay. All right, B. Smith, do you have any tips or rules of thumb for adding variability uniqueness to individual models in an army without breaking the cohesive feel of belonging to the same army? Yeah, 100%. So the girl on screen is actually a good example. She's meant to go in the Slanesh army, which looks very different, right, for the most part. But I wanted her to be unique. But I used a lot of the same signifiers, even though her skin is a different tone. I used a lot of the same pinks and blues. And, you know, like, you can... You just need some signifiers that feel the same. So, like, make the tabard look the same or something like that, or the hair color, you know? Like, you can play with those different kinds of elements. Um, uh, I don't know if it's actually called tabard. Whatever. Like, the, the, the cloth up here or the cloth between the legs. I don't know the names for these things. Somebody said, isn't a tabard worn above the chest? I don't know. Um, but the... The point is, is that like if you have like the hair or the feathers or the gems or a few details or the weapons or, you know, whatever, like just pick a couple of those elements and make them the same and it will still um, fit in. Oh, there you go. The paladin cloth crotch protector, often called a tavern, is actually called a scapular. Neat. Oh, hey, well, there you go. We're learning stuff. Okay. So there you go. I think we're down to the bottom of my questions. I caught up. Yay, we caught up. All right. Uh, I don't think I missed anything else. So if anybody has any final questions, hopefully we're still here. We're all coming through. Hope I didn't lose everybody or something. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be terrible? Um, but I think I caught up with everyone. So if anybody has a final question or so, I'll answer it. Uh, but otherwise, I think we're good to go. Uh, any final questions? Now's your chance. Put it in. There you go. I'll wait. We'll see what's happening. All right. No, nope. nobody has. Oh, there you go. Okay. There it is. Now they're coming in. All right. What product should be used to thin acrylic inks to airbrush? I use Vallejo thinner, standard thinner, the same thinner I use for everything else. I don't use anything different. My thinner will generally, I'll put a drop or two of, uh, or a couple drops of flow improver in my little bottle that I mix it out of, but just that thinner. Uh, how do you recommend differentiating different units in AOS? I use a color unique to the squad, uh, but is there a method you use on your clouds of witch elves? Um, I don't have clouds of witch elves. I only have, I don't have any witch elves. I own zero witch elves. My sisters are all snakes. Um, and the answer is yes, some small visual signifier. So like on the snakes, I did different belly patterns. Um, you might do a different stripe in the hair. Little tiny things like that. Uh, there you go. Uh, oh, did you miss the question regarding chimera colors? I did somehow. I'm sorry. What was the question? I haven't used them yet is the short answer. <laughs> I will order them at some point. I'm trying to work my way through all these new paints. But, like, I need to use those kinds of things for a while. Um, Chris Schur, the artist, has used them a bunch and absolutely loves them. So I have no doubt they are high quality and are great. I just haven't gotten a chance to use them yet. <laughs> but if he likes them and I've seen what he's accomplished with them, he's a great artist. Um, I'm quite positive that they're, that they're good quality and worth an investment. Uh, are you going to Dragonfall? No, sadly, I cannot. I uh, had other conflicts. Um, any other techniques that the old masters use that you think might be fun to try and use in model painting? Oh, boy. I mean, a lot of stuff. 
Um, I mean, Grise itself, Zenithal highlighting is just Grise, right? Which is an, an, an old master technique. Um, but yeah, I think it's worth an exploration. Like, there's no reason we have to start from scratch. I think it's very much worth looking at those those types of things uh, and, and seeing what they did. Could you repeat making red pop? Yes. Use white. Use ivory. So you take your red, you put it over your zenithal, then you apply ivory highlights to where you want it, and then you do thin red glazes over the top. Thin, 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 repeated red glazes. The first one will look pink. The second one will look red. Then you do it again in a smaller area, and it will you'll get this intense, insane red. Um, I do it in the uh, warm zenithal highlighting video, so you, you can check that out. <clears throat> Any tips to apply a cold, ethereal, ghostly look on my Graveguard blades? They are already corroded, just looking for a little pop. Um, yeah, you could, like, two ways. You could edge them in, like, a verdigris color, like use verdigris as an edge highlight. And then you could take a deeper, darker blue, almost like a deep turquoise. Let's call it either a blue, like a Vallejo model color turquoise or blue-green, like those two, and hide a little of that in the shadows in the same way that you saw David Soper hide it in the shadows of Gut Rot Spume. So there you go. Uh, how far along is the video about masking fluids? I don't know, man. It's I don't know that I'm ever going to... We'll see. It's still on the list. I just don't use masking fluids so often that it's hard for me to ever get a chance to really do it. But it's there. Uh, what is a good element on a miniature to start with to learn on wet blending? Cloaks. Absolutely cloaks. Cloaks, cloaks, cloaks. They're the easiest to do. They have they have the same structure as your brush when you're painting vertically, so you don't have to like twist or turn in weird ways. Cloaks, cloaks, cloaks. Yep, right, there you go. That was the same answer Nathaniel gave, and I agree completely. Uh, ever tried contrast paints or other contrast paints? Yeah, 100%. I do it in the video. If you go look at the Ultimate Guide to Contrast Paints, you'll see I do that, and yes, they work great. Um, <clears throat> uh Uh, so, IG Infantry only, I need a way to tell the difference between Company Commander, Platoon Commander, and Sergeant. All are last pistol chainsword. When things get bunched together, what is better than a base? Um, then, oh, the rim of the base? Uh, the base they're standing on. So I'll make my, I usually make my commanders stand on different things. The higher rank they are, the taller they are. Um, so, like, heroes are almost always standing on things to make them slightly taller. Um, small elements like feathers and things like that you can put on the top of them, or distinctions or purity seals or stripes or marks things in the composition of them that makes them look higher rank that stands out fairly easily is my general answer because if they're all huddled in together the base is going to be covered up too so you want something up top here that's generally going to be more visible and so making them an you know up to an inch taller or half an inch taller is a good way to make them stand out uh, have you painted any WizKids minis, or will you? Yeah, sure. I've done several of them. I like them. Um, I've done like a couple trolls, a couple halflings, just fun stuff like that. They're fun little detailed projects. I've got the Modrons box that I'm pretty excited about that I'll paint at some point because Modrons are my favorite thing in D and D ever. Modrons are the greatest thing in the history of D and D. Um, period. They are the most wonderful creation that we were ever gifted, and I love them. Uh, specifically, they came into their own when when. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Detir Lizzie or whatever, the artist who worked on the original Planescape, reimagined them into the beautiful form that they came into and, and just became uh, a wonderful, wonderful concept of a mix of, of humor and beauty and hilarity and awesomeness. So, yeah, um, I was actually just, I was I was really just to, yesterday thinking about getting that modern out and painting him. There you go. All right, so we got a good hour and a half in. Sorry about the mute in the middle, guys, again. That's terrible. Um, I'll watch that and be very careful of that. It kind of slipped to the side of my chair, and I leaned in it, pressed on the mute button, and I didn't notice. Uh, but at any rate, I hope this was helpful. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope that I got to your questions. I hope this was helpful. Uh, but if you have any other questions that I didn't get to, you can always drop them down in the comments. Happy to answer there. But as always, I very much appreciate you watching this one, and we'll see you next time.